My founding story started 11 years ago with my PhD in computer science. In the beginning of my PhD, I was exposed to this topic of supply chain management. And shortly afterwards, an incident happened that was moving me personally. In April 2013, a factory building collapsed called Rana Plaza in Bangladesh and tragically killed more than 1,100 workers. Because I was working on this topic of supply chain management, I looked into this incident in more detail, and what I found was irritating to me. So there were actually early warning signs that this was going to happen. There were hundreds of people in front of the factory building weeks before, demonstrating that they are concerned about the building safety and the cracks in the wall. These protests were documented in social media data, in digital news media data, in the local language, but they were simply not seen. This brought up the thought in me that we need to do something about this. This incident could have been prevented if better data was available. And if this is possible, we actually have an obligation to work on that and to fix worldwide supply chains. Next to the topic of supply chain management, I was working on a topic called social media analytics, which was basically making sense out of text data that is produced in real time on social media channels. For my PhD, I was then deciding to connect these two topics to research the question, can we use social media data to better understand supply chain risks? Fast forward, uh, the next five years were academic research, developing natural language processing technologies that could turn text data into supply chain risk data. 2017, we founded the company, my co-founder and me, and then four years of product, like looking for product market fit, followed. After that, we had three years of steep growth, and today, Prewave is one of the leading supply chain intelligence providers, and we are monitoring 1.5 million factories in real time to deliver actionable insights to more than 200 enterprise customers, some of which are the biggest uh, enterprises in the world. What are we doing as Prewave? Um, we are a B2B SaaS company based in Vienna, Austria. Simply speaking, we have an AI technology that is mapping and analyzing risks in supply chain networks to help our customers reduce disruptions, increase sustainability, and ensure compliance. In terms of growth, this is the team that we had in 2021, when we, just before we found product market fit, and then we were growing quickly over the next three years, 2022, 2023, 2024. We are now about 230 people in four different hubs. But when people look at Prewave, they mostly look at the last three years and tell me that this looks like an overnight success, but as a founder, I can tell you this is really not what it was. <laughs> so before that, there was this four years of search for product market fit, and before that, there were five years of PhD research on the actual technology. So in order to overcome this long time of uh, having actually no uh, revenues coming in, we were raising venture capital. In total, we raised 95 million euros in five rounds, ranging from pre-seed in 2018 to Series B just earlier this year. The first three rounds were very different to the, next, uh, two, uh, to the yeah, last two rounds. So in the first three rounds, it took us approximately six months to get the first term sheet. The last two rounds took us about four weeks to get a term sheet. So I just want to say we have seen both, yeah? the really hard to raise rounds and the easier to raise rounds. But let's zoom in on Series A, and I will try to tell you a few practical lessons learned that we had from these fundraising uh, processes that you can hopefully apply in your, um, on your journey. So this was the trajectory we had when we were raising Series A. I think when is the right moment to raise a Series A? So I think one important ingredient is that you need to have a very clear vision on how, whatever, wherever your company is right now, how that path could look like to become a very big company. So it means the product needs to be there and you need to be able um, to sell it because uh, typically it's expected that you have at least 1 million euro ARR at this point. There are four things that, from the processes we have run, uh, we believe are the most important factors in a successful uh, fundraising process. First one is planning. So very practical. You need to think about when do you actually start your fundraising process. And the second one is like how much do you actually want to raise. On the first one, you should have at least nine months of runway and ideally an internal backup plan to stretch this to 12 months, you know, because you don't know how long this process is actually going to take and when the money will be actually on the bank account. Second, very practical thing, avoid July and August and end of December. 
having said that, I need to admit that we closed our Series A round in August. <laughs> it was not um, the easiest, not advisable. So if you can work around that, then it's definitely better. Last thing is make sure you don't have any other very important things going on at the same time, like an office move or a personal house move and things like that. How, about the, how much should you raise? How about the round size? Um, so investors will probably tell you, raise the amount that you need for the next 24 months to ideally get to 10 million ARR. That is a correct idea, but in practice, for us as uh, founders, it was uh, hard, yeah? Because first of all, we didn't have a finance person when we raised the Series A. We had a financial plan, but we didn't have the feeling that it was particularly great at that, at that stage, and there were tons of assumptions in there. So instead, we took an approach that we tried to approximate the valuation that we can achieve. And how did we do that? We looked at other Series A rounds that ha happened in our segment, in our region, and we tried to collect some data points to just uh, understand where our valuation could end up. So we talked to different advisors and investors and other founders to find that data points. And then we aimed for a 15 to 25 percent dilution. So to make this very practical, let's say there is this other startup, Startup A, um, also a B2B SaaS company at 1.5 million ARR, recently raised for 30 million post money valuation that gives you a 10x revenue multiple from the revenue to post money. Apply this to your startup, maybe you are at 1.7 million ARR, you put a 20x revenue multiple on that, you come up with a 34 million post valuation, you put a 15 to 25% dilution, gives you a round size of 5 to 8.5 million. So then you plug this in into your financial plan, and then you actually um, yeah, have a reasonable range you can work with. On this range, I would always advise to go for the lower end first, because it's always a good dynamic in a fundraising process to increase the round size during the process. But it's really bad if you, it kind of turns out that you cannot fill up the round. Yeah? So I would advise go smaller first, and then extend um, during the course um, of, the, of the round. The organizational setup, how did we raise our Series A and other rounds, is we had, we had two co-founders, and one focused on the business and client side, and the other one, um, so me, I focused on the fundraising side. And then we had one additional person to help build the material. About the pipeline, and this is probably the most important ingredient here in the process, so fundraising is really a pipeline game. What does it mean? You start with a huge number of opportunities, and then people will drop out, or funds will drop out during the process, but you have the goal to eventually end up with one term sheet. This is how our Series A fund looked like. We had a list of 125 investors. We were in contact with about 80 investors, and in the end, we ended up um, a few months later uh, with two term sheets. One point for the founders amongst you that maybe are still about to raise a pre-seed or seed round, for us it really made a difference on the Series A stage that we had already institutional VCs on board in the pre-seed and seed round. So how can these existing investors help you with a Series A? First of all, they can make introductions. So it's always good to not come with a cold outreach to an investor, but to be introduced by somebody else. And that's where your existing investors can help enormously with. They also helped us to qualify other VCs, just finding out whether a particular VC is a good match for your stage and for your company. They can help you give you some information around that. What was also very helpful is that in the pre-seed stage, we had already VCs that made sure that we have a market standard setup in terms of legal and corporate setup, yeah? so that our terms and our shareholder agreements, everything was um, really a market standard VC setup. And the last point is that um, yeah, they might even lead or co-lead your Series A. The investor CRM. So this is basically a sheet, spreadsheet, yeah, of um, yeah, a list ideally of more than 100 different Series A investors. So I would recommend come up with a template, yeah, and then you do some research on Crunchbase, PitchBook, and the internet to kind of populate this, uh, term uh, this, this template. You ask your existing investors, other people in the startup scene to basically come up with this um, let's say, pipeline of different investors that qualify for your Series A. General hints on the list, I think it's good that you qualify them, that you make sure they really invest into your segment. If you're a B2B startup, make sure they have B2B startups in their portfolio, they invest in your region, in your stage, and so on. 
I think it's good to have a good mix of very high conversion VCs and other maybe longer shots, you know, the dream investors uh, you would think about, but then having also a lot where you have a very good chance to, um, of conversion. For example, VCs that are really investing in your region or maybe if you're situated in the same city, the same country, others that have a particular relationship with your industry, or others that missed out in a competitor's round, if you know things like that. Generally, when you think about what is a good investor, many people think about, okay, what is the best investor I could imagine? I would really encourage you to think about avoiding to make a mistake at this stage. You will work together with these investors for the next five to 10 years. You will have them on your cap table. There's literally almost no way to kind of separate. So make sure you just don't make a mistake. So I would really focus on making sure you have a strategic alignment. So you think uh, the same way about the journey of the, of the company. Particularly now when there is this question on uh, growth versus profitability, it's important that you are completely aligned on that question. We always optimized also having a very good personal connections with the decision makers and the funds, having a very good culture value fit, because those people will help you to hire the managers in, your, in the future. So it's very important that you have a good fit also on the value set. Generally, it's always important to um, aim for market standard terms and avoid any exotic agreements because that will make future rounds extremely hard. If you are in this lucky position to have several term sheets at hand, we always optimize for the ones that have the best understanding of our market, for their reputation of the fund, because that will make future rounds um, easier, and for the experience of the partner, the contact person that we had on the investor side. There are also some nice to have. Many investors will pitch you, yeah, like they have the platform, they have the, uh, the help. That is always good, yeah. But for us, it never really moved the needle. If from all things, what is really, ma really made a difference is help on the executive search side, on really getting experienced managers into the company. This is where we really had a lot of help from our existing investors. Now, let's say you have the li list. What's next? So, and now I need to <laughs> give credits to Creandum, one of our investors on board, because they had drove me through several workshops, workshops on the fundraising process, and this is something I learned from, uh, from them. So the phase before you actually kick off the fundraise is very critical. <laughs> so one to three months before you actually start to raise, it's important that you start with casual intro chats. And very concretely, what does that mean? You go work on that list and you try to get introductions to as many as funds as possible, and you will have a first casual conversation. It's important to not have a pitch deck there because you're not raising yet, right? So you're just having a casual introduction, getting to know each other. Why is it important to not uh, create the impression that you're raising? Because when you will actually start to raise in two or three months, people will have the feeling you are out in the market already for too long. So it's just very you make clear, I'm not raising at the moment, focusing on execution, but I would really like to get to know you because we plan to raise in about three months from now. So what you actually want to achieve with these casual intro chats is that all of those investors put it into their calendar. For example, Prewave will be raising Series A in January next year. <laughs> Reach out to them. And that's what you want to achieve at this moment. And that will give you a very good base then to do the actual fundraise. At the same, uh, yeah, this will also give you the opportunity to actually already get the first feeling on that funds and to prioritize that list. That will also give you a better starting position when you actually start the big outreach for your fundraise. At the same time, um, yeah, you should prepare your data room and your pitch deck, and that's the next ingredient uh, um, that, that is very important for your Series A. I will not tell you about the contents of the pitch deck. I think there's more than enough information in the internet, but I will tell you a bit more about the uh, details yeah, that I feel are really harder to get. We always uh, work with four versions of our pitch deck, a teaser deck that is optimized to create an initial spark of interest in 30 seconds to a new investor, a short deck that is basically five to seven slides is giving the story in a very short form, something that we can send out before an actual pitch. Then we had the presentation deck that was extensive, sometimes 30 pages, with lots of backup slides that we would bring up in case there is a particular question. And uh, then we had the long deck, the one we actually sent out after um, the presentation, um, which basically is, gives you the full story um, in text. Yeah, it's very understandable. Yeah. This is the one we uploaded into the data room. 
maybe some specifics that I just learned throughout the rounds. Um, now we, we don't share any pitch decks in PDF format anymore. We just share the links. Yeah? This increases the confidentiality, makes it harder basically to send your pitch deck around. Um, so we share a link. Yeah? We upload this um, to a virtual data room uh, tool. Um, and that gives you the option to say that it cannot be downloaded, it can only be viewed, it can be watermarked. Basically put the name of the VC fund on each slide of the deck. Um, there can be some email authentication, so that can increase the confidentiality. You can update the contents live. If you figure out there is one slide that really is misleading to most of the investors, you can just change it. And you can view the investors' activity. So we are using a tool called DocSend, for example, and it kind of lets you then view um, when are the investors logging in, on which pages of the pitch deck are they looking on most, uh, and it gives you some idea about who is engaged in your process and when. What are some lessons learned? Yeah? I think in the earlier rounds, we spent way too much time on really getting the data room ready. Yeah? So we let the investors wait. So like, yeah, we talk to them, and then we're like, yeah, we still need one or two weeks to get the data room ready, and we always felt we, we cannot really open it yet, and so on. So I think it's important that the data room is ready once you start your outreach, and that you have like an MVP, like the minimal viable data room, um, rather than that it's perfect, it needs to be ready on time. Otherwise, you will lose momentum. The second one is you can start with a base set of materials and then add things by the day, also as you get feedback from the investors where they have most question marks on. We, in, for our Series A, also spent way too much time actually on making a business model. Um, so both of us founders are engineers by background, so we built a very complex model <laughs> that later on I, I feel few people really looked on because it was just so complicated. Yeah? So if I was to do it over, I would go with a template, make it as standard as possible, and Series A investors actually don't expect that you have a business, perfect business model in place, and very often they will make the, their own version of your business model in the back. There's tons of templates out there. For example, there's one also from our investor Creandum that they publish on, the, on their website that you could use. Ideally, plan some time for your existing investors to give you feedback both on the data room as well on the pitch deck, as well on, as on the pitch itself. Yeah? That will, of course, increase the quality. And a learning we have just made in the recent rounds is take that money, 300 to 1,000 euros, to pay an, a designer to actually make your pitch deck look professional. This will um, just increase uh, yeah, just improve the impression that the people get from your company. So let's come to the active process. Let's kick it off. So what you really want is to create this feeling of FOMO, fear of missing out. The goal is to have multiple term sheets on the table at the same time, so you have a good negotiation position. So that means that you really be, need to be very conscious about the timing and time boxing in this process. So you can reach out to a set of investors from this list that you created, that you had already warm, casual introductions with, and then um, basically tell them that you're now kicking off the process. You can send them the teaser deck, for example. Then you can schedule 30 to 45 uh, minute pitch meetings. You present the pitch, answer questions, and you make sure that there will be five minutes also for you to ask questions to the fund. That will help you to create a feeling on uh, who are the, uh, the best partners for this round. I think it's very important to have the data room link ready, yeah? that you can directly send it out after you had that first pitch. Otherwise, you will lose momentum and you will lose some of the funds. So how to balance now? You have, let's say, 80 investors that you're talking to, for example. This trade-off between quality and quantity. It's not possible to talk with 80 investors at the same time. The way out is to apply a wave strategy to basically divide your investors in the CRM into waves of 20 investors, for example, yeah? and then according to priority. Yeah? And then you start kicking it off in week one, reaching out to wave one to these 20 investors on the list. Yeah? And then you start these conversations. Once investors drop out, and that will happen probably quite quickly, that some people will say, no, it's not for me, yeah? then you just refill from the next wave. And in week two, you can basically make another push to the next uh, wave. Yeah? So this is basically um, a wave strategy that I also learned from Creandum. Is basically you always have this set of active discussions, and then you fill um, th this pipeline um, from, from this backup list, and in that way you can keep momentum up over several weeks, what you actually want. So some lessons learned and some practical things as well. Um, I would advise to get a good tech setup. This can really make a big difference. Uh, a good microphone, a good camera, maybe even a standing desk, so you can do really good pitches in front of a, because most of them will be probably over video call. 
It's good to, after every meeting, ask yourself the question, what could you have done better in this pitch? And then try to do it better next time. It's, you need to be prepared to take lots of rejection and never take it personally. It's just a part of the game. Yeah? If you have this pipeline game, you will get 50 or more rejections. And it's just important to always keep a positive mindset, a winner mindset, um, and just wake up in the morning, tell yourself, you can build this new category leader. In a few years, your company is going to be a global champion. Yeah? That can be hard, you know, when you get lots of rejections, but just drive yourself into this winning mindset. Never give up. It's going to be a, a probably exhausting process. And just continue, continue. And particularly, don't get blinded by initial love. Yeah? We were in processes where we had the feeling, this must go right. It all feels so good. And suddenly, something happened after the IC. A partner changed their mind. Competi competitor was coming up, something, you know, and it's not going to go to the term sheet stage. So only, actually, a real designed term sheet counts. So keep fighting until you have that in place. And don't stop with the process too early, because you have the feeling it will really go well with this one investor. So yeah, eventually we closed our Series A with um, funds called Compass and Ventec. Ventec already invested in the seed stage and was a co-lead uh, on the Series A. That uh, was really a positive signal and helped us. We closed an 11 million round in the end. And towards the end of the process, something happened um, that I feel is not really often talked about. But um, uh, yeah, so we had an oversubscribed round. So what does that mean? It means that there was actually more in, um, investor interest than the, we had uh, basically, we could allocate. And then one of the investors brought up this idea, yeah, maybe you want to do a secondary. And I didn't even know what a secondary was at that time. But I tell you, because I will later on tell you how this changed a bit the tra trajectory of, of my personal life. So I was working on this already for almost 10 years and uh, literally didn't have much cash in the bank account because I was putting everything into this company. Um, and then, basically, the suggestion was if you sell a very small part of your shares, you know, investors can get a bit of a bigger ticket and you can get a bit of cash to put on the side. And this was very beneficial for me because at the same time, um, I just had a kid of one and a half years old. So I basically raised the seed round while I was pregnant. A few months later, I got my first child. And having then a bit more flexibility on this cash side really enabled me um, to kind of solve this challenge yeah, between having a small kid and then running a hyper growth scale up. And I'm telling this particularly also to the other female founders out there that this was something that really enabled me to solve this challenge in a better way. It gave me more flexibility you know, to organize childcare. My husband could take a step back from work. We could have babysitters and logistical problems. So in the end, just wanted to say this really helped me to solve the challenge. A year later, but maybe one important thing, be very careful with the signaling on asking for founder secondaries. We didn't ask for it, it just happened. Somebody suggested it to us. Many investors will see this as a red flag if you kind of ask for that in such an early stage. It's not common, but just saying this can come up and, and, and in our case it really helped. One year later, we raised the Series A+, plus, an extension to our Series A, and this was the first round we raised, not because we were running out of cash, but because we saw the company is growing faster than we actually thought, and it's time to step even more on the gas. So we went out, raising an opportunistic round. We said, OK, we will go out for fundraising. If we find a good partner, we will do it. Otherwise, we will just not do it, and we will continue how, uh, our plans. But we found a good partner, and this was one round where we got a term sheet within four weeks. Um, we closed this round with Creandum. Um, yeah, a great investor here out, um, out of Europe, um, invested in Spotify, Klarna, and so on. Um, and that, um, yeah, that really was a great step forward for us as a company. Also, maybe just I told you in the beginning, don't play any big personal things in the meanwhile while you're raising. Um, I raised uh, my sec at this A plus while I was eight to nine months pregnant. Um, my daughter came three uh, days after we closed the round. I'm not recommending this. I just want to tell you it was possible in our case. Um, Last two last things I want to tell you. I think you need to just realize that your success of your fundraise will depend a lot on the investor relationships you have built up, both with the future investors as well as with your existing investors. Yeah? So you have a reputation out there in the investor scene. So just take this very seriously. So you need to also round up the process with all investors who did eventually not get the opportunity to, in, to invest in your company. Those might be great investors for the next round. Also, after an investor invested in your company, it's important to build up a very good relationship. Be very transparent, be consistent, be, be proactive, be honest, be just a very good partner on their side because they will keep on telling other investors then how 
how great you manage the company, let's say. Your investors will be a very big success factor for the future rounds, so always take this very seriously. The last thing is that I want to say is that um, if you read the newspapers out there, of course, there's lots of challenges that we face as a global society coming from wars, climate change, economic instability. I feel it's really on us here to find scalable solutions that can be launched in a few years that are rapidly scalable and can solve some of the biggest challenges out there in the world. So we just encourage you that you focus on opportunities that both drive revenue growth as well as positive impact to society. As Prewef, we are really committed to that mission on making tomorrow's uh, supply chains both more sustainable and more resilient. And a few years from now, we will monitor risks in all factories in the world. And that will make the difference that cases like Rana Plaza will hopefully never happen again. Thank you. Looking forward to see your questions. Later.